too many times. Uh, I consider this a trigger warning now, since we're talking about maps, I'll be talking about the election. <laughs> so if that makes you upset, uh, be prepared. <laughs> uh, it's not too much though. Um, great, so maps. Um, generally, maps are a special type of spatial data. Um, so we'll be talking, like from the rest, for the rest of this class, we'll be talk talking mainly about a spatial data visualization. Um, and maps are this odd form of spatial data that are somehow usually treated as part of information visualization and not as part of scientific visualization. So that's probably because the design aspects of maps um, are paramount and it's not so much about the algorithm and so on. But in this case, they're kind of a special case of spatial data. Um, and the general um, like recommendation is to, to use maps when the spatial uh, relationships are paramount. For example, uh, when you want to show uh, the path that the Mormons took to emigrate to Salt Lake City, of course you need a map, right? Uh, but not for every possible um, task that, that you could use a map for is a map actually the best uh, approach. Um, so tasks on a map would be find the location, find the feature, like a county, a country, a city, a street, find routes, similar to pathfinding in, in networks, we, we've seen this duality between them, um, identify attributes associated with the location, for example, the elevation, uh, whether it's land or water, um, how the, the gradient, the GDP, the population associated with a certain like, political district, for example, and so on. And then comparing attributes between locations and features. Um, and every time you think of to use spatial data and think about rendering um, a map, ask yourself the question, do I really, really need a map? Uh, because the problem is that maps they, they, as we'll see for the rest of the lecture, they have uh, certain kinds of restrictions. So this is like one of the examples that um, you may have seen uh, in the context of the homework. Um, this is a political map of how states have shifted over time, right? So we have the 2012 election here, 2008 election here, and then we see all of the states and how they have shifted. Um, and so, like, for this, we, we, like, you could think of this as a map, and you could do this with small multiples, with various maps, and color coding, and so on. But it wouldn't be as efficient as communicating the swing here. Um, so here you can vary, for example, like Utah is an interesting case, of course, because um, it voted pretty, uh, let's say for Utah's, um, for Utah standards, it voted pretty democratic uh, when Obama ran against McCain. And of course, when Obama ran, ran against Romney, we see the swing uh, back out to very Republican voting. Um, so like. Here, um, we have so much information associated with every single um, political or area, states in this case, that using a map here wouldn't be great. Um, and then here we have another example from the current, um, from the current elections. Um, here we have states, and we could show this information how Trump and Clinton um, have won these states. Uh, we could show it as on a map, and of course it's important to show it on a map, but here we show so much information for example, we show uh, the percentage of vote this was already counted, the reported margin, the projection by the New York Times, the win probability, and then here it actually shows us these, um, these projections plus minus a certainty, like an interval of certainty. And conveying all of these data points on top of a map is really tough. And so, it, it, any, like most of you guys, you don't know, you don't have to know, or you don't have to see on a map where New Hampshire is to know where New Hampshire is, right? For, for states that you're too, very, very familiar with, you don't actually need to show the map to convey the information here. So ask yourself whenever you uh, work with uh, geospatial data, is the spatial context paramount? And of course the answer is going to be yes for many cases, but I think that maps are a little bit overused. Um, so that's how, um, uh, that for the rest of the lecture, however, we'll assume that we'll be talking about maps specifically. And so when we talk about map projections, like map projections are of course the, the, most, like, the, the most fundamental part when we think about the maps. So why do we need a projection? Well, um, for, um, if you want to project the Earth uh, onto something uh, two-dimensional like a screen or paper, we somehow need to unfold them. You don't have the problem, of course, if you have a spherical display or if you have a globe. Uh, but whenever you have like a planar display or paper, then you need to uh, project this, this, the globe uh, onto, this, um, onto this plane. 
Um, and so uh, there are, like if you think about this, then you can come up with a couple of relevant attributes. For example, these projections, similar to what we had with graph layouts, there are different criteria that you want to optimize for, but not all of them can be achieved at the same time. So for example, uh, we can try to optimize for preserving area, for preserving shape, for preserving direction, for preserving bearing, for preserving distance, for preserving scale. Um, but we cannot do it for all of them at the same time. Um, I do like this XKCD comic here uh, about what your main favorite map projection says about you. Um, so I just, um, I recommend, this is too much text of course to talk about here. Uh, a globe, yes you're very clever, uh, it's my favorite one. Uh, but take a look and read this, this is quite informative. Okay, um, the like most commonly historically used projection is the Mercator, Mercator projection. Mercator projection was developed in 1569. Um, the idea is to um, project uh, the, um, this, the, the, the earth onto a cylinder. Um, and it's a conformal map projection, that means its angles are preserved and you have lines of constant bearings corresponding to straight lines. So for example, if you want to sail from Asia to South, um, uh, South America, uh, you kind of like only need to calculate your, wing, uh, your angle, plot a straight line, and then you can follow that. So it's a, it's a great map for uh, sailors, for seafaring um, um, use cases. Um, here is an example of the Mercator projection in D3. Um, you have used um, D3 projections, so I'll not be talking too much about uh, the implementations. Uh, and here's the Mercator projection of the Mars. And notice that the circular craters appear circular on, on this uh, projected image here. However, Mercator has certain problems. Um, it especially, it has like cultural biases. It's like this traditional map that, that was used to teach geography. Um, it made, like, however, it distorts massively area that is distant from the equator. Because if you think about it, since we're um, projecting a globe, onto um, a cylinder, everything that is far away from the equator gets more space. Um, and so it's considered to be unfair to the global south, making places that are mostly trees, snow, and better off white people look huge, and the places where most of the world's population lives look puny. Um, and this is another quote that I want to read. Mercado works really great if you're, say, Ferdinand Magellan looking for a compass bearing that will take you around Cape Horn, because all of the latitude and longitude lines and angles in between lay out nicely and straight on the map like we experience them in real life. It also works well if you're Google and you want a map image that you can neatly slice up into little squares that your server sends to a customer's browser. North is always up, your hometown doesn't look squished or slanted when you zoom in and everybody's happy. So um, this is a hybrid problem. Like most of you, um, like if you think, like if you look at the Mercator map, um, you will massively underestimate how big the area around the equator is. And so this here is an example of, of that. Um, here you see Africa and China, Western Europe, India, Argentina, and the United States all mapped on top of it, um, just to give you a, a size comparison. Um, and I also do like this a lot. This is a Mercator puzzle. And so I'll ask you to help me to identify. So the goal here is to take these shapes and move them to the right locations, right? And this is pretty obviously Italy. So here you can see, like, if I place Italy here, it locks it in. Um, and then we need to figure out these other uh, states here. So, and then you see the effect of the Mercator projection here. So as I move it from Antarctica to the equator, you can see that this now is extremely much bigger than here. And so who has an idea what uh, country that is? It's Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, yes. So Kazakhstan looks a little bit bigger. And what do we have here? That could be... No. Yeah. Yeah, the hardest ones for me... Yemen? Yemen? Yeah. Okay, now I have to... Uh, wow, yeah, so this is like, like a classical example, right? It looks tiny here, but if we move it up here to Europe, Yemen is bigger than Germany and France. That's Somalia. Somalia? Mm -hmm. Yes, 
or exactly around the equator. And again, if we put it into Europe, uh, we see it's uh, like bigger than, than uh, Norway or and Sweden combined. Okay, so you can play around with this, but the idea here is really to give you uh, to um, give you a feeling of, of what the Mercator projection does to these traditional Mac projections. Is that the last Which one? This one? Yeah. Poland. Yes. What is this? This could be. Korea, yeah. Uh, doesn't fit. Okay, well, it's not easy to do because we kind of like, um, not like, it's, it's not easy to, to get shapes um, out of, outside of the continents that you don't know so well. And it's of course not easy if you don't, if the shapes behave that erratically in terms of how they rescaled. Um, so here is an example um, of <coughs> Australia. And so you can see that Australia is actually much bigger than Greenland, for example. Um, the caveat about like Mercator projections aren't inherently bad. Um, they are only a problem for large areas when you want to visualize continents or the whole world. Um, they are distortion is not a problem on a state or city level. So on, on a, like if you zoom in uh, far enough, Mercator is actually one of the best projections that you can use. Uh, but if you want to show a, a world map, it is it has all of this cultural bias um, that uh, is associated with it. Um, what you can also do instead of a Mercator projection is to simply plot latitude and longitude. Uh, this does not preserve angles, it does not preserve areas, and things are squashed at the top and the bottom. Um, so here, like Canada looks, uh, and here like you can see it for Scandinavia, that looks pretty squashed, that's not the way um, you usually see it. However, this is kind of useful if you just want like half data, for example, that maps to the United States, you can just plot latitude and longitude off these points, um, and you will like see the shape and you don't have to do any complicated projections. Of course, you should do a projection eventually, but just to prototype um, latitude, longitude plotting is definitely a fair. Um, another approach is azimuthal projections, where you project the Earth onto a plane tangent to the Earth. Um, here, angles are correct around the center point. So the angles here are correct, but angles from here to here, for example, are not correct. Um, Great circles through the center are straight lines. Uh, the radii correspond to true distances, and this is sometimes like used in airline magazines centered around their hub. So what you can do here, here uh, the North Pole is picked, but of course you can pick any point uh, in the in the world as the center um, of this projection. Um, so here um, is an example for that in D3, and here is like a time life. Um, uh, a Time Magazine uh, illustration of how Time reporters travel um, around the world. Uh, this is a, uh, an older uh, graphic from the uh, no, 60s or 70s. Um, okay, another one is the Winkle Triple Projection, which is a modi modified azimuthal map projection, uh, which is averaged to a cylindrical projection, and it tries to minimize three kinds of distortion, area, direction, and distance. Um, none of them it doesn't get any of them perfectly right, but it kind of like finds like one minimization of them. And this is what is commonly now recommended for use in, in uh, ge geography textbooks. Uh, it's recommended by the National Geography Society. And so here is, is what that looks like. That kind of gives you a, a proper, uh, like a rather fair representation of um, size of land mass, um, position, angle, uh, and so on. Um, with respect to what, what is actually like, uh, the case on the globe. Um, this shows um, circles of equal area on top of the projection, so you can see um, how they are squished and how the, the, how the uh, areas are distorted, and you can see um, that like, on the outside, of course, there's more distortion, and here on the outside, there's also more distortion, whereas here at the center, there is little distortion. Um, then there are maps that are, that are created specifically for, um, for uh, certain regions of the Earth. For example, this projected Albus equal area um, shows the area correctly, but it distorts distances and shapes, and that's kind of commonly used for uh, the United States map. 
Um, this here is a really interesting project. So, like, as I already mentioned for the McCarthy projection, the optimal projection depends a lot on your zoom level in a map. Um, and so, these guys had the great idea that they can build a tool that does adaptive projections. Um, so, this is actually live. So you can see here is the hammer map, then here are Albus Conic, then Lambert, Lambert Cylindrical, and then at the very bottom there's Mercator, Mercator, and I can simply zoom in here, and you can see here we're transitioning between projections. And so I can zoom in further, and now we have another projection transition here. And on the Mercator level, you see how that flattens. And for the polar aspect, there is like a, and then, uh, a, a separate projection that you can see, like the transition here. So this is really neat. However, this is of course um, not so easy to do if you have a lot of geometry um, and if you have images and so on, um, like Google Maps. Um, you have seen these projections in D3. D3 comes with a couple of standard projections here. Um, and then there is a large community um, of D3 developers that um, does the, is these extended geographic projections. So basically anything that you could desire in terms of projections uh, is available in D3. Um, and uh, you, you, you've either already worked with how this works in D3. You can upload a geojson or a topojson file and then you can project that file um, according to a certain projection. Um, another way of, of thinking about projections is that you don't actually, like you could uh, simply tear the sphere apart and, and like make these little tears here. Uh, um, and so the question is, how can you tear it apart? And so this is like a nice video um, to use small patches and flatten them out. Um, and then essentially like distinguish between um, area that is not on the globe and just background and areas that are on the globe. And so there's this nice video. Doesn't have any audio, you just see different uh, flattening approaches. So the last projection, the one that last is like by sea, so that all the land masses are preserved, and now it's the inverse by land, so that all the oceans are well, next is the um, by land, so that all the oceans are preserved, which is then a very unfamiliar picture. talk about map software, GIS software, and navigation. Um, you all know Google Maps. Um, a recommendation for if you do like a, a, a software project, Google Maps has a great API, but if you need more control and if you need the, the data, you can actually take OpenStreetMap, which is an, uh, an open source alternative to, uh, to um, Google Maps or Apple Maps. Um, and both of those provide an API where you can do things like mashups, so where you can um, like visualize data on top um, of a map. And so typically, I recommend these mashups if you have some kind of navigation context, right? If you want to see where the next bar is on Yelp, uh, you, you definitely want to have a mashup and not some abstract representation based on, on GeoJSON because you want to have all of the context of the map. And so if, if you have something like this in your project, for example, 
I recommend that you use a, the Google API uh, or, a mash, uh, or the OpenStreetMap API to create these mashups. This is um, a mashup of crime against uh, uh, crime over the University of Utah um, from this website. It's not very current. The data is from 2013. Um, so I only realized that they, they seem to have shut down their service. Um, but this was one month of crime data in 2013 at the University of Utah. Um, for navigation, um, there is like this compromise between abstract and specific. So this was like a bar that I like to go through during my postdoc. So you could get these abstract instructions, um, how to walk and where to turn and what, which, which uh, mode of transportation to use. Or of course, you can get the specific, um, the specific directions um, on top of a map. Um, and there is, of course, a, there is also this compromise, these hand-drawn maps. So if you, like back in the day before Google Maps, if you were to give directions, uh, you wouldn't usually print out a map and, and draw on top of it, but you would give uh, somebody directions by, um, by showing the highlights. So like here, are the, these are the main streets, this is north, and this is where you go. Here is like one big landmark. You continue this drive, here are, um, here rains or trains, and so on. And so this, this like, hand, um, these hand-drawn maps, um, they, had, they, they kind of like focus on the important features. Um, and so some researchers actually have thought, oh, this would be nice to do um, also for, um, for like navigation uh, systems. For example, if you uh, wanted to, like before we had all um, live telephones and navigation systems, if you wanted to sit down at home and print out your route, for example, from going, to, from, going uh, from Michigan to Madison, um, you could either do it like this, or you could get this abstracted version that only highlights um, like all the important decisions where you have to turn, for example. So it doesn't here in this case, it doesn't matter that this there, what the, the bends in the road are. It only says okay, you have to go on I ninety four until it hits I twenty two for uh, two ninety four. Um, so there are no straight wiggly lines. The turn directions um, are more like more explicit. Um, and uh, contract long and short, uh, long regions are, long roads are contracted here. Um, and then, here, of course, this is also very important to properly label. Um, and this was actually, for a while, um, was implemented as in Microsoft Maps. It's now defunct. Uh, but you could actually get the directions like this. This was done by uh, people that are affiliated with Microsoft Research. And then uh, this was ported to an actual product in Microsoft now. This is not working anymore. Okay, so next I want to talk about choropleth maps. What is a choropleth map? That is uh, uh, like these typical political election maps, for example, that you see. We have areas that are shaded or somehow patterned in proportion to a measurement. And each spatial unit is filled with a uniform color or pattern. And so this is like uh, a very early example of that. And the illiteracy in France from 1826 you can see that illiteracy in the center of France was higher than in the region around Paris uh, and bordering to Germany. Um, this is like the Kerry versus Bush map, and as usual um, in political, uh, in the U.S. political maps, you see that red on the maps uh, dominates massively because usually Republican candidates do better in rural areas, whereas Democratic candidates do better in in, uh, in urban areas. And of course, the population density is higher in urban areas, and therefore. Um, we don't have a fair representation of um, pixels, so we have like a not a fair data to ink ratio. So if you, for example, um, look at the 2004 popular vote, Bush won 62 million votes, Kerry won 59 million votes, the amount of red shown in the map, however, is about five times as much. So there is this, this is kind of the lie factor if you think back about this Tufty's rule, the data to ink ratio. Ah, the lie factor, not the data to ink ratio. Um, and so another XKCD, um, one of the main mistakes that people make when plotting any data uh, on a map is not properly accounting for population density. So here is our site's users, subscribers to Martha Stewart Living and consumers of foreign furry pornography. All of them show the same distribution. Uh, and all of them show essentially only population density. So it doesn't really show you anything interesting other than where people live. And if you pay attention, you will see many of those maps. Um, here is a, like an interesting map that shows you where people live in the United States. Um, so you can see that, of course, the east is much more densely populated. The northeastern corridor 
whereas New York City is the most densely populated area on the East Coast, and then like the uh, um, Bay Area and Los, uh, and Los Angeles are the densely populated areas um, in, um, on, in the West. And you can see for Utah that Salt Lake City towers supreme above all the rest of Utah. Um, you could um, do this by county, and you can like you can like it doesn't necessarily have to be like a win lose map. Of course, you can show um, uh, the percentage of the vote that goes to certain people. So we have here a color map. Um, you could also like consider population density. So for example, here um, for unpopulated areas, you show it basically in a very very light white. So this gives you kind of a better feeling for. Um, how the votes are distributed uh, for this particular election. You still can see that red, red dominates, but there are these like very dense blue clusters. So I would argue that this is probably a like a more a fairer depiction. Um, one approach to actually solve this problem um, is to use a prior and then show the difference. So here um, is a data a data set that is. Um, First, this is the original raw data, event density of mischief in Canada. Mischief is property damage, for example, vandalism in Canada. And so it looks like that Ontario uh, is like the very, this, this um, state that is like deeply plagued by, uh, by vandalism. Uh, but then, of course, if you, like, when you, if you listen to me in the last 10 minutes, you'd say, well, this is just because there's so, so many people uh, in, in Ontario because of Toronto. And there is less, of course, a lot less people uh, living in Nunavut. Um, so let's normalize this by um, by population. And so if you do that, if you um, normalize this per capita, uh, then you can see that Ontario here is very low. But now it looks like Nunavut here is very high. And this, I forgot the name of this province. Province. Um, so um, the problem here could potentially be. That you have uh, that, that very very few people live here, so you have the vari the variation that you, that you would expect is much higher, and so instead you could like um, create a map based on a prior where you have a model of population density and account for the variable uh, variability when anal analyzing very small numbers, and so then you see uh, and you can also show it as a sign surprise, so like how surprising is uh, this, and then you can see that Ontario is actually Given the population, it's, uh, there is less uh, vandalism than you would expect. Uh, there is more vandalism than you would expect in the Great Plains region here. Um, and for Nunavut, here the, var the variance filter basically kicks in. It, it, there is so little data there that individual incidents uh, could actually like, lead to this massive increase. And so if you're interested in this, this is probably the best approach of using core plot maps, of course, you have to communicate a little bit more what is going on. This is a paper from this year's BIS conference. Um, it's called Surprise Maps. Um, so if you're interested, look at Michael Correll's uh, paper, Surprise Maps. Um, here's another example. Um, this is unemployment. Um, and in this case, unemployment rate. So this doesn't really fluctuate too much uh, based on the population density because it's a rate. Um, however, um, you can still see that it is like pretty like checkered here, uh, especially in the Great Plains region. Um, and this is of course uh, again based because of the variance, because we have um, so few people living there that the rate between the counties can fluctuate dramatically just because of chance. And so if you use this prior again, um, you can actually see um, this deviation from the mean uh, exclude any statistical variance. And then you can see that the Los Angeles area, for example, and the Detroit area um, really stick out in terms of unemployment, and also Florida, and that the DC area, for example, uh, is, um, has uh, like pretty um, uh, low unemployment rates. When you're talking about using a prior, is that a statistical term? Yeah, all it is? Okay. it's a Bayesian prior in this particular implementation, but okay. you can use any like um, model and show the difference to the model. So instead of showing uh, the raw data or some simple measure, you can actually find a statistical model and visualize the deviation from that. Um, this is my favorite curve cleft map. Uh, it's um, the density of bears in Finland visualized as bears. So it looks like in the uh, 
eastern part of Finland there's more bears. Um, and then um, you've probably seen these, uh, these, these maps of sports fans. Um, this is based on uh, maps of baseball fans based on their Facebook um, preferences um, over, over, the, over the country. And so you can see that we have giants, um, like Utah doesn't really seem to care much about baseball. In, in Los Angeles we have this clustering between Dodgers, Angels and Padres, and the Dodgers seem to dominate the northern part. Uh, the southern part of California, uh, Rangers dominate all of, all of Texas, and Red Sox dominate um, New England, um, New York, Yankees. Um, so you can see that the Yankees have fans outside of, like in states that are not, um, they don't have their own baseball team, so they seem to be like the team that people talk about in the nation. Here is an example of uh, basketball, uh, I think that was to this map is from when Kobe Bryant was doing well. Uh, there's a lot of Lakers fans all over the country. Lakers dominate uh, basketball also in Canada. Um, and so here, I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but this is a map of the nation's well-being uh, on the New York Times. So you can pick many of these different uh, attributes and look at um, how people rate um, the well-being with respect to these factors um, in, in this core plot map. Um, so nothing um, unique about um, the visualization here, just like a good data set, interesting data set to play with. Okay, um, an alternative to core plath maps are proportional symbols maps. Um, and the idea here is very simple, to use a symbol instead of just coloring the whole shape. Uh, and we scale the symbol according to the data. So this is a, another map of the uh, Bush versus Kerry vote. Uh, and we can see that instead of like coloring each of these counties here, um, the counties get uh, um, assigned a circle proportionally to the vote margin. And so you can see that these big circles um, show like a big uh, win for Kerry, the big blue circles, the big red circles show a big win for Bush. And so what you see here is that um, Bush uh, Kerry won in the major urban areas. Um, with like a big margin, but then there's a lot of little circles all over the country. Um, of course, if you use a proportional simple map and have something like population density here, you will inevitably get a lot of overlap. Um, and so therefore you need to make these, um, these symbols in some way transparent uh, so that you can still see something aggregated here. For example, the Northwest Corridor where there's many uh, different densely populated um, political districts uh, and you still can get an idea of what is going on. Uh, this is from this year's election, showing us the shift of um, how, how the population shifted, um, how, the, how Trump reshaped the electoral map. So we see that there was like a shift to the right in all of the Midwest here. Salt Lake City, interestingly, shifted massively to the left. <laughs> um, and so there's not, not surprisingly, there's not a lot of left shift. Um, um, there is some left shift in uh, California. And here the size of the area uh, of the arrows corresponds to the magnitude of the shift. And so if you scroll through this map, this is like a nice scrolly telling uh, example. Like here, the Midwest is highlighted, everything else, else is uh, hidden. And these are the, the uh, areas where Clinton made gains, which are not very many. And then uh, this is uh, compared to uh, Mr. Trump suppressed him? No, this is just a, an, an extra text box. Um, this is another visualization of the same thing, but I'm watching the post. Oops, I forgot to add the link. Oh. Um, yeah, I'm not going to search for that now. Um, they, they use a bit of a different encoding. Um, they so first, they actually, what is very unconventional, um, they flipped the map over so that it doesn't point north. So here's north, so that east points up. Um, and then they show these like mountains to show the magnitude. Um, the height is the total vote cast. The width is the margin in net votes. The color is, of course, the party. And the stroke strength is um, the, the percentage. 
And so essentially each of these, um, these glyphs here encodes a lot of variables and you can sit down and study this uh, in detail. And, and not surprisingly what you see is that the, the, small population, uh, the, the small population areas have this like, strong um, stroke width uh, that kind of showed that um, they had a Republican landslide there. And you can actually scroll this, and there's a lot of nice an annotations and so on. It's I'm not the, sorry, it's the stroke width, not the width of the triangle. The stroke width, yes. I the stroke it's... width is the fixed stroke is a county one in a landslide, and the width is the margin in net votes. Oh, so, so it's both it actually. Also yes. Okay. Uh, and it codes both. Um, Um, Here is another proportional simple map um, of people that um, applied for FEMA assistance after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and you can see that how, how um, victims of Katrina had this diaspora that um, drove them out of uh, the New Orleans area and into all, all of the country, including California and the whole eastern seaboard. Um, of course, in this case, people still tend to stay locally, so we have this extremely uh, dark black. Uh, area down here. Um, here we see uh, an interesting distribution for John Kerry versus George Bush in New York City. So you can do this, of course, also um, in, in, in the smaller, um, on a small scale. And you can see that in Manhattan, that on the west side uh, and in downtown, uh, John Kerry actually had more support versus the east side. Uh, John Kerry had more support on the, yeah, in the uh, in downtown Manhattan and on the uh, east, uh, west side versus uh, George Bush had a lot more support um, east, uh, on, the, uh, on the east side. There are people making fun of these uh, proportional symbol maps. Of course they have the disadvantages, especially in the Katrina example. Um, they look fancy, people like circles. Uh, I would argue that they are probably better than just a plain core plot map. But of course, there's a lot of occlusion going on in, in dense regions. Um, this is a map of uh, surnames uh, across the United States. Let me see if I can zoom this in. Yeah. Seems like I have. Oh well. Sometimes anonymous browsing helps, but probably pulling it from the school's network. Yeah, so okay, that's not great now. Uh, well, so I can show you here. Um, this shows you the most common, uh, like this is a mix of a wordle um, and a, a, a color uh, and, and a map. And so you see the most common uh, names. This is the East Coast, so you see Smith and Miller here are pretty dominant versus around Boston. Murphy, O'Brien, Sullivan, and so on are dominant. Um, so this is a nice map. It's unfortunate uh, that we can't look at it in more detail. Um, fat fonts are this interesting mix of um, like glyph-based encoding, numerical encoding, and um, and the, like a pixel density. I think I've talked briefly about fat fonts before. Um, so fat fonts. The idea behind fat fonts is that the the darkness, how, it, how an, a digit appears, corresponds to its value. So one is very white, like the cell that contains one is very white, the cell that contains nine is very dark. Um, and they have also designed this so that you can nest it to multiple levels. So this is 489, uh, for example. Or if you had 481, you would see that in there it is pretty white. Um, and so you can like create these these maps, for example, of, of, uh, of population density or of elevation, um, where you can actually, if you go, like, you, you have a, a sense of what it is uh, from a distance, but then if you go, if you walk up to it and look at the details, you can actually read the digits. Uh, and you can actually read exact values from the map. So this is more, like, as I think said last time, I, I consider this to be pretty neat and interesting, but more from an artistic, like, this is more data art than data visualization, because like, um, it, it's not, um, it doesn't reveal something that you couldn't do better in an interactive system. Um, 
This is another population density map. In this case, however, the dots are colored by race, so you can see um, the segregation uh, pretty well in this case. So Lake City is probably not very interesting here, but in New York City, um, you can see this segregation uh, by the races. Um, in Brooklyn here, for example, there's a major black community. And then in the Bronx, there's a major black community versus like most of Manhattan here is white and then Chinatown here is red. So, but just by plotting um, every city block um, based on the predominant uh, race, you can see these very clear segregation uh, lines. Um, then, um, this is, well, uh, this is a map that was published after the, the Connecticut school, school killings, and I'm mainly showing this to kind of make you think a little bit about the ethics of visualization. Um, because, like, you could say, well, this data is publicly available. This is, like, um, a Freedom of Information Act, a lot of U.S. government data is publicly available. You can look up all of your professor's salary, for example, if you want to, in Utah. Um, but you can also look up who owns a gun in your neighborhood. Uh, however, this is a little bit tedious to do. You have to go to a, some government website, you have to put in a, like, a neighborhood and so on. Uh, but somebody has created a scraper and now published this map um, where you can zoom in and see all of your uh, all of your neighbors, and this map was extremely controversial because you could look like who uh, who in my neighborhood is a gun owner. Um, so, is there a distinction? And I'm not going to answer this question for you, but if data is public, do you also have to think about how you make it accessible? Is like this level of access something um, that 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 you need to like where you need to kind of um, think about the the ethics of journalism um, and the the people that actually um, posted a map, they got into pretty uh, serious trouble with their um, newspaper. Um, I think one of them actually was fired, but I don't actually remember in detail. So you can go to this blog here and read about this case. Okay, am I doing time? Good. Um, so contour or um, maps, um, they, like here we show something with, with this line. So this is an early map. Uh, that shows um, lines of equal magnetic declination, which is of course important if you uh, if you want to use a compass while you're at sea. Um, this is also like this um, from 1701. This is also uh, important for wind. So this, these are major wind patterns in the oceans. Again, very important for sea uh, faring. Uh, and, and then here, what how this is visualized is with these hatchings. And so the hatchings here, uh, we'll, we'll, you'll see that more in flow visualization. Uh, these hatching here, they indicate um, the direction and also the intensity of the wind. Here is a, a, a live example, which is done by... What's that? It's on a link to it. It's broken here. So this is a live map of the wind in the United States. Um, and so this is like a, I think this is pretty, pretty well done and pretty neatly implemented. Um, and this fundamental, or I don't know what is exactly this implementation, but um, you will learn about line integral convolution um, in, in the flow visualization lecture, um, that, how you can actually show this. Um, there, and you can also like, here's a legend where you see the speed of the wind. Um, so you can see in the Great Plains and around Denver there is a pretty high wind and we don't have a lot of wind right now. Um, there is also, um, on this website, there are also some interesting like historic uh, wind patterns. So this is Hurricane Sandy. And so you can see that pretty, pretty neatly here. Uh, Hurricane Isaac. And so on. Uh, and then you use these contours also to um, to visualize elevation in topographic maps. Um, and so I don't know, you guys, some of you are probably hikers or climbers. 
um, or if I'm by and so on, and then you're uh, probably used to these maps where each line corresponds to a certain change in elevation and then flatter lines correspond to like a major change in elevation, so here we are 1,000 feet, 900 feet, 800 feet, and so on. Um, here is another um, contour used here. This, this map shows the forecasted path of the hurricane plus some uncertainty around it. Um, so this is like this, this way of visualizing um, uncertainty with, with visualizing these bands uh, on top of maps is, is uh, I think, pretty neat. Okay, so I have a map-based design critique today. It's purely static, you don't need your computers. Okay, let's take five minutes, talk to your neighbors if you like, uh, and then we'll talk about them. Snack plus maps together.
Okay, so what's the purpose of the disks in these charts? Expresses the magnitude of the number of uh, early limerents. Okay, and why do you think um, they use disks here? Because the not so if you have a so you need to continue to this is Exactly. So if you want to use size as your visual encoding and not color, then you can cannot um, do that on a map. So the idea here is to use this disk instead. And so what is the problem? Why do we need to do this? Why can I use just like color, value, or saturation? Because the area of the state will bias um, Interpretation. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it tries to address this problem that we talked about for core flat maps. So an like, example that I like is that Austria, my home country, is like a tiny country in the middle of Europe, but we're good at Winter Olympics. Um, and so when we visualize the medals, the number of medals in Winter Olympics, like Austria gets this big bubble. Um, if you look at the paper, <laughs> there's, one in, uh, there's one example in there. Um, not so good for Summer Olympics. Um, so here we see this like illegal immigrants map and then this migration map. Um, what's the purpose of the colors? Just to label. Just the states. Yeah. And so um, we have said that color. There's only so many that we can use. Um, how do we get? It, how do they? These guys get around this here. Labels. Exactly, and so how do, we, how do I know that, for example, uh, Colorado here uh, corresponds to this one, and New York yeah, up there with the same color, same size, corresponds to the other one? Proximity. Exactly, so they, like, this is a layered algorithm that uses these circles and tries to put them in proximity of these maps. Um, why do you think they are arranged in circles? To show spatial relationships between states in a rough sense. Yes. Um, any other interpretations? Why not just like some other positioning as we like as we've seen with the with the election maps where the circles are directly on top of a state? Uh, it's very well reliant. Uh, like it's easier to make it proximity. Say for example, you take the center point of all the states and then yeah. So that we can move the circles around all the circles so that they're confused. Exactly. You said something. It's also to get rid of overlap. Exactly. So that's one of the problems of proportional symbols map, right? To overlap. And so this gets rid of, of overlap. Um, then, uh, what is in this other chart here? Again, the migration chart. Exactly. So we have an additional piece of information, the, the size of the population, but we also have flow information, how, how like, people migrate within the Netherlands. Why would that be, or do you think that wouldn't be, would be tricky to do um, directly on the map? Yeah, because it's hard, like, it could be, for example, people tend to uh, migrate between adjacent areas, and so where would I draw the area, right? So if I have this, these distinct shapes, I can actually, um, I can actually separate them. So, what is missing here at this visualization? Can you? Yes. So it, there's like, that's a big mistake. That they don't have any legends in here, so we don't know how many illegal immigrants are in total, for example. Uh, we only have an idea of proportional, and we don't know how it's scaled, and so on. So they should definitely have a legend in here. Um, so, any opinions? Do you like this chart? I think it's really effective, uh, except that it's kind of hard. It's cluttered. It's very cluttered with all the extra color. With the map underneath, is a little bit almost too redundant in some scenarios. Yeah. Somebody else an opinion? Really 
Well, yes, to some degree, I agree. But then you have like there is, I'll, I'll show you another example later where, where that is the case. Um, um, but yeah, so what, I guess what they're trying to do here is to show both magnitude of the population and also the um, migration patterns. Any other opinions? I think it looks good. Like if I saw it in a magazine or something, I might stop and look at it for a second. But other than some loose comparisons, like you don't really learn that much from it. Yeah. I mean, I can tell that California has more than Utah, but that's all I can tell you. Yeah. I think the lines between on the circles, um, it puts some artificial uh, relationships in the data, perhaps, like it was trying to imply flow or, or something like that that really isn't there. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they added the lines? I actually like that because it keeps the, it, it keeps regions, it kind of lets you, you can abstract it into a region. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, I think it could be, people could wonder why is this, like this here where it is, if you didn't have those lines, right, they would be confused why. Is the Utah label up there, not directly on top of Utah? Um, so, any other concerns? Could I do this, do you think, on a county level for the United States? So, I'm thinking what is the point of using math, for example, in the immigration in the Netherlands? So, I, I mean, isn't that redundant? I mean, without the math, we can get everything out of, out of the visualization. Uh, can you say that again? I mean, what, what is the point of using map beneath all of these circles and things? Yeah, to give the spatial context, I presume, but you're right. You could also just move that over, right, and have both next to each other. So if this was interactive, then you could just have linked views and two separate views. Yeah. This is a static technique, though. So um, this was a paper, I think, in 2010. Uh, it's called Necklace Maps. Um, and I think it's kind of a neat idea, but then, I don't know, um, all of these issues that you guys said, and I, I personally don't know whether you wouldn't be better off just um, not trying to do this on top of the map if you have complex data, as you, as you said, um, like this. Um, but yeah, I'll have another example for that. So yeah, um, it's one interesting approach of doing that, um, and this kind of leads me to um, the next um, uh, to the next um, section of this lecture, which are um, necklace maps themselves and also cartograms. And so, like this idea of having uh, areas that are disproportionate to um, to what the data they represent, uh, people have tried to uh, tackle that by, by using these distorted shapes. Um, so here is a cartogram of internet users, uh, and you can see that the United States here is big, that Canada compared to its landmass doesn't have a lot of internet users. And so you get the idea of cartograms here is to like show you like, like give you a rough spatial context, but then use the like distorted um, and then um, to to map the variable. The problem with that is of course that um, you get like if if you have low data like this, um, you get these very thin slivers. Uh, with the necklace map here, for example, that works much better. Um, so you can actually visualize this much better. Um, so we'll talk more about these cartograms in a second. Um, the idea here of cartograms uh, is to not scale by um, not scale by distance, but just to keep a rough distance and instead scale by some data. Um, so here, these are um, cities of the United States scaled by their price, like how much it costs you to fly there from Atlanta. Um, so. Well, I guess you can see that flying up to Green Bay is a lot more expensive than flying to New York from Atlanta here. So it tries to preserve some of the geographic uh, context, um, but it, um, it includes, like, uh, uh, but it, it is scaled by, by some other measure. And so this is try, like, trying to compromise between, um, between um, the data and the geographic positions. Does anybody have an opinion on this? Or maybe too much information for me again. Um, <laughs> it's just seeing the city's distance seems useful, but seeing all the state lines is really kind of getting in the way of comprehending what's going on. Yeah. And it also defeats the purpose of using the map. The purpose of using the map is uh, it's showing people something that uh, they're familiar with. Yeah. 
and when you distort it, you are uh, removing the information that they have, already have, and it doesn't really help you. Yeah, exactly. So this is a big problem for these category approaches. It's like they try to do two things at the same time, and they have to compromise on both. Um, here are other examples that are, I think this is like um, scale the area of the data. I think this is maybe a little bit better done because it doesn't, um, like we have these familiar shapes uh, that, that are preserved here. Um, so we are fine with having white space in here, uh, but we have these, these uh, familiar shapes, El Elvis concert attendance per state from the 1970, it's just 1977. Um, and then like here are, here's a, like a couple of examples of these, these explicit cartograms. So if we have a world map like this, and then map it by population, we see uh, India big, China big, uh, Canada as usual small, and Russia very small uh, compared to its land mass. If you map it by GDP, we get this like contraction here and the contraction of Africa and the, like Europe dominates and the United States dominate and then China and Japan uh, dominate in Asia. If you did it by child mortality, uh, we see that uh, Africa and uh, India uh, dominate here. If we did it by greenhouse gas emissions, we see that America, China and Europe dominate. So all of these maps, they, they, they give us some context, but they don't really, like, they, they, they have exactly this problem of, like, we lose the geographic details. Um, we also cannot exactly compare, like, by looking at this, we don't know whether the United States emits more or China emits more, right? We have, like, a rough sense that they're roughly um, equal, maybe, but it's, it's hard to compare in detail. Um, here is a Kerry versus Bush map scaled. Um, I would probably, if you showed me this map and didn't tell me that it's a map of the United States, I would probably not recognize it. Um, this is like a blob. It's an ink blob test. Yes. What's up? In that greenhouse gas emission map, it was, uh, when I'm trying to think about that, I'm thinking, okay, is the actual data encoded by the expansion or contraction relative to the normal size? Or is it just like based on the total area of that? I think that the area here uh, is defined completely by the number. So if a big country, like for example, Russia doesn't emit a lot of greenhouse gases, it's probably easy to see in GDP. Russia doesn't have a lot of GDP. Uh, Russia has a lot of land area, so it is like kept roughly at its position, um, but it is completely squished together because the GDP of Russia isn't as high as um, Another question going back to that. Sure. So when you have the United States and then Alaska is separate, is, are we supposed to interpret that as the total area of those two represents the United States? Good question. Um, I guess, yes. Okay. But that's, like, I don't think that Alaska emits that much, much greenhouse gas. Yeah. As it does here. Or that Alaska has so much GDP would also be surprising. I think that Alaska probably looks like a lot of, like Russia, if you just take it by itself. Okay. So it is, it's probably, um, the, the continuity doesn't matter, the overall size matters. Um, you can do this as rectangular cartograms, as, as like word population here. Um, this is drawn by hand, or you could do something a little bit like you did in your homework um, to like just have approximate positions. Here this is by um, counties probably, um, Bush versus Kerry, uh, these rectangular diagrams. And I would say that this is like maybe like giving only this rough context like you did it in your homeworks makes a little bit more sense um, than trying to do these very distorted cartograms. Um, this is an example from the New York Times um, where you can like actually do it, but this is used where you can also browse through various different examples. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this. So, but here you can see like, this is based on uh, how, how much is being purchased in which country. Um, and so um, I think that's a pretty like, interesting uh, representation and for the selected countries I think it works pretty well. Okay, next I want to talk about flow maps. Um, this is an example of an early flow map of transportation of passengers in Ireland and not surprisingly this heads towards Dublin. And so what we're interested in flow maps is some kind of geographic relationships of, for example, how people are shipped, how people move, how goods are shipped, and so on. And I'm sure you remember all from high school, geography, uh, education, 
when you saw like all of these major trade patterns across the world uh, on, 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 on maps, um, these, these are the kinds of flow, um, flow maps that, that you'll see. One of the famous flow maps here is this, this, current, this, this um, flow map by Minal that shows Napoleon's campaign of Russia. And I showed this to you in the very first lecture. Um, this is kind of a very ingenious way of combining spatial context, of um, combining the size of Napoleon's army, their locations, and then annotating it with special events. Just to a quick recap of what this shows. It's like here, um, the width of the stream here represents the size of Napoleon's army. Whenever they branch off, then the army split off to like, go on a sub-campaign, basically. Um, and so they were marching towards Russia, uh, towards Moscow. And you can see, all along, they, they lost a lot of men uh, in their campaign. And then when they like, tried to conquer Russia, um, they actually didn't lose a lot of men. And only in their like, in, on the way there, in the retreat, you see that more and more men were lost, and that there are, like here, this, on the retreat, there was like a terrible winter, and this is also juxtaposed here with temperature. Um, and so you can see that it was really cold, and that's why people suffered massively here. And then like, at the river crossing, about half of the remaining army perished. Um, so this is like an interesting example of a flow map that is like handmade, and that's considered like one of these historical gold standards of visualization. Um, this is the uh, flow map of the effect of the U.S. Civil War on cotton trade. So before um, the uh, Civil War, um, you can see that the United States exported cotton massively to Great Britain. Um, and then right after the Civil War, this completely died off. And so instead, they uh, imported um, cotton from Asia. Um, here is like a life. Uh, or an interactive map of um, migration. Um, so here, let's see where it does work. So I can click on any county and then see where people migrate to. Let's see from Salt Lake City, or Boston to Salt Lake City, this is me. I can see that from, uh, from Salt Lake City, this is where people move. Uh, inbound and outbound, inbound in blue, outbound in red. Um, so, like, using interactivity, this kind of like is a little bit like we saw this in the graph lecture. Um, you can see that in the Great Plains, people mainly move within the states. On the coast, from let's say Long Island, people move all over. However, again, the question is, do you really need, need a map for that? Um, so here is a, like a non-spatial representation um, of these migration patterns. And the nice thing is, by using this non-spatial representation, I can show a lot more data. I can show um, a time, how, how uh, migration changed since the 1900s. And so this is like a, um, the population where people um, migrated into. Look at Utah. So where people born in Utah moved to, and so you see that in the 90s, like the majority of people that were born in Utah stayed in Utah, moved to Idaho, moved to California, moved to other states in the West. So either people that were born in Utah predominantly stayed in Utah or moved in the West. There's not a lot of people going to the East, not even now. Um, and you can actually switch migration into Utah. And you can see that uh, there's only 60% of people um, that were born in Utah nowadays. The proportion was higher around the war. Um, and then we had this uh, high number of people, like 20% of people that, were, uh, that migrated to Utah were, not, or were born outside the United States. And that's only at 9% right now. And again, you can see that this pattern is like mainly uh, from the West. And there is other states, for example, I'm sure that California, for example, has like a much different um, pattern. So this is for every state. Well, Florida is also a good example. Um, so Florida, like a lot of people moved to Florida, um, and you can see how that switched from uh, first in the in the early like uh, the first half of the century. Of the previous century, it was mainly people from the south, 
And then in the second half, it was mainly people that were fleeing the cold uh, from the Northeast and New York and Pennsylvania and so on. So you see these, these patterns here very easily, which would be hard to visualize in the map. Um, here is a, like a visualization that is completely, doesn't use a map, but is of spatial data. These are uh, all the flights over France. And the interesting thing here is that flights, of course, have three-dimensional information, right? So we have the elevation of the planes, um, and we also have the position, and, and, and speed, and all of these other variables. And so in this tool, they can actually um, transition between uh, position, um, like position on, on the map, and elevation dynamically. And then you can see that around the Paris airport, Charles de Gaulle, uh, we have this massive clustering, and now this is dynamically mapped to the elevation. Now here altitude is mapped to the y coordinate in the screen, now latitude is mapped, mapped to the y coordinate in the screen again. And so now this is dynamically transitioned. Um, this is another example of migration data. Um, this is actually like a good example also for a fixed graph layout. So here are migration patterns. Um, but only for selected areas. So here, like the, um, the Pacific Northwest is highlighted, and the Los Angeles area is highlighted, Florida is highlighted, and then the, north, uh, the Northeast is highlighted, plus some like uh, Great Plains uh, region up here. Um, and so this shows, you, this shows us, like by color coding and filtering only those edges that are in, um, that are in any of these rectangles, but then here is a completely abstracted version of that. So here, we don't actually see the geography anymore, and we only have these, these patterns. And we see that people predominantly move within Washington itself, or move from New York to Florida, or move within Florida, and so on. So like, by, by dynamically like, aggregating this, we can simplify this diagram if this spatial context here, like where exactly that is, isn't that important. We, we know that this is Washington, we know that this is Arizona, we know that this is Florida, and we can see these patterns very clearly, and then we can also visualize data uh, within those cells um, again. Okay, so um, at the end of this class, I briefly wanted to talk about completely data-driven maps, a little bit like the flight map, so where we don't use uh, geography in the first place, but just use the data that is geolocated. So, um, we don't use a map to render on top, we just let the data make up the map. Um, and so here's a, uh, an example of all the, the centers of um, zip codes in the United States mapped to, uh, to um, their uh, center, like to the center of this county where the zip code that, that corresponds to the zip code. Um, here is an example of um, the census. Like there's no map here, it's just dots of people, where people live. And you can clearly see here Cape Cod, for example. Um, this is a map that connects all of the zip codes uh, as, they, um, uh, as they increase. So like if you have zip code 1001, it's connected to 1002, it's connected to 1003, and so on. And this reveals political boundaries. And you also see that the, the, like population density in some way. You have like very uh, few zip codes around here, uh, very dense zip codes where there's a lot of people. Um, this is a um, data set of uh, real-time uh, movement in Amsterdam. And it's more of like an art project than a data visualization. But you can, like, again, no map, and just by like tracking people, uh, we can see we, the, the, the structure of the city reveals itself. And then this is a project by Microsoft Research. Students, it's all about data visualization. How do we make sense of all the massive amounts of data around us? 
We use principles of information visualization to make it easy to understand the data and see the patterns within the data. So let's take a look at this data set here. These are actually 50,000 counties, but there's information, there's, there's structure in this data. So if we actually map it onto a map, we can actually see that structure showing up. And then when we actually shift to a histogram of motion, it really helps you understand the data. If we switch back to the map, where we go back to. So we're going to actually look at some results from the recent election. So here what I'm going to do is map onto each county how they voted. And you can see actually the blue counties and red counties, and it looks pretty extreme. But actually, it's much more nuanced than this. So if we look at a different palette here, you can see that, uh, yes, it's blue and red, but it's not quite so extreme on either case. And in fact, we can even break this apart and actually look at nine different graphs. Here are the most extreme on one side, the most extreme on the other side. So if we actually select a point over here. So yeah, the idea here is really just, you don't need projections, you don't need maps, you can just use uh, geolocated data and plot it directly and then do these, these fast things and, and if you have enough data uh, you still get like usable uh, displays. You okay. Still, you still need a projection to the no. points in there somewhere. No, I just plot longitude versus latitude. Oh, okay. So it's gonna be squished but you can project it if you want to. You shouldn't use this on a world map uh, <coughs> because you get like these effects that we saw earlier for example for northern countries. Uh, but for the United States, that works just fine. Like this doesn't have a projection. And so you see, for example, that most projections of the United States don't show this as a straight line, the border of Canada, but show that like uh, as a like a, as a, a circle. Okay. Uh, and so, like at the very end, this is more like um, for context. There, you of course can have thematic maps. So here is like uh, the island uh, stations of the Dharma Initiative, or here we have like. Um, this is not real data, and it's not real visualization, but you can come up with like um, maps that don't represent real geography, but in this case, represent the internet in 2007, so we can see MySpace and Orkut and AOL and Yahoo and so on, and basically none of, not, nothing of, that existed back then is still here, maybe Wikipedia. Um, and like this is the updated version of 2010, and Facebook is dominating. Uh, it looks and Twitter has some space and Skype and so on. I don't even know what QQ is. What's happening? I don't know. That. <laughs> Probably some Farmville uh, sh shoot off like Facebook games in 2010. Um, then maps don't have to be exclusively of geography, right? Of larger structures, you can also use maps of, of like indoor structures. Here is one hour in front of the television. Um, how people move, um, and then like the most extreme thematic map is like um, this is London, very rich, and then the losers. Uh, so that's it for today. Um, next week um, we will be start talking about scientific visualization. On Thursday there is a guest lecture for everybody who's watching online. Uh, our guest lecture on Thursday doesn't like to be recorded on video, so you will unfortunately have to miss this. Um, everybody else, uh, please do come on Thursday. It's it's doesn't look really great if we invite somebody to come give a talk and nobody's here. Thank you everyone and see you on Tuesday.